everyone, uh, the Spark AI Summit. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the conference yesterday um, and is looking forward to the sessions uh, today. We've got some, some really great content lined up. Um, so I'm going to kick off the conference uh, with an update on MLflow, the open source machine learning platform project that uh, we started at Databricks last year. And I'm really excited today to launch a whole new component of MLflow, the model registry uh, for model management. So before I talk about that, I want to step back a little bit and explain what's difficult um, about using machine learning in production, what MLflow does uh, to tackle that, and then I'll start um, talking about the new component. Um, so we see a lot of organizations starting to use machine learning and get great results with it. But then the, the problem that happens you know, to, to everyone we talk to in this space is uh, they realize that machine learning development is a lot harder than traditional software development. So it's very difficult to launch and maintain uh, these, these machine learning applications. So why is it difficult? So let's break it down, actually, by looking um, at um, uh, you know, the differences between traditional software and machine learning. So so the first difference is actually the, the goal of what you're trying to do. In traditional software, the goal is usually just to meet a functional specification. For example, if I click this button, you create a new file. You know, if this person has this permission, they get to see the file and so on. So it's pretty clear cut what the goal is. Either you meet it or you don't, and it's relatively easy to check whether the software meets the goal. In contrast, in machine learning, the goal usually is to optimize a metric. For example, the accuracy of your predictions. And every improvement in this metric, you know, every 0.1% improvement can translate into you know, significant uh, business value. And every degradation in it can be the difference you know, between your pod, you know, product working or losing money. And as a result, because you're trying to optimize this metric, uh, you're, you're, you want to constantly experiment to improve it. You're not done. You don't just say, OK, it works now. Um, the second difference is what affects the quality. So in traditional software, the quality only depends on the code you're running, which is nice. In machine learning, uh, by, by definition, machine learning is programs that generalize from data. So the quality depends on the data you put in and also on tuning parameters that you may have to change based on the data. So it's much harder to keep track of that. Um, and finally, in traditional software, you usually just pick one software stack. You know, you pick one database technology, one web server, and so on. Maybe one programming language and you write your application. And in contrast, in machine learning, because you're trying, to, you know, you're always trying the best algorithms, the newest algorithms to improve this business metric, you want to be able to compare and combine many libraries, models, and algorithms for the same task. So getting your application to make these easy to swap in and out is also challenging. And even once your application starts working, it's harder to operate. The traditional software, you just ship it. If you don't touch it, it usually keeps working. With machine learning, you have to keep feeding it with new data. And if anything breaks in there, uh, you're in trouble. And the whole process of running it usually involves many different people using different tools. For example, the data engineer who gets you the data, the machine learning engineer who can work on the model, and then the application developer who packages and, and deploys the model. So what are people doing about this problem? It's obviously uh, uh, quite a bit more complicated than traditional software. So the solution that's come up in, in a lot of places is to design a new software that can manage this machine learning application lifecycle. And this software is called machine learning platforms. And the idea here is to encapsulate the lifecycle behind some APIs or, or some, 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 uh, con some, some data structures that let you do things like versioning your data and models, uh, continuous integration and deployment, uh, QA operations, monitoring, and so on. So some of the best known um, ML platforms are, are at the large web companies, for example, Google TFX and uh, Facebook FB Learner. But every company we talk with is developing some kind of uh, ML platform. So we started looking at this space last year at Databricks. We wanted to provide something like this, and we realized that there's no open source machine learning platform, and everyone is kind of rebuilding the same thing from scratch. So that's why we started MLflow, an open source end-to-end -end machine learning platform. And in designing MLflow, our philosophy was to make sure it works with whatever infrastructure you know, your company already has or wants to use. So uh, unlike these very specific company internal ones, MLflow is uh, based on simple uh, you know, REST 
REST APIs that work with any machine learning library, programming language, you know, deployment infrastructure, and so on. Um, and in the first version of the project that we launched uh, last June, we added three um, initial components, um, experiment tracking, reproducible projects, and model packaging. And all of these you know, have uh, you know, a, a bunch of improvements and, and use since then. Um, and you know, we were really excited about how much the MLflow community has grown. We didn't know what would be uh, the interest for something like this, but a little over a year later now, we already have 140 contributors on the project. Just to compare, you know, the, the team um, that, uh, that I work with, the, the engineering team at Databricks that runs this is only 10 people. So lots of uh, external, um, you know, non-Databricks contributors. And we're also up to uh, 800,000 downloads a month. And for Apache Spark, in contrast, when that project started, it took about three years to get to the same number of contributors. So we're really excited about that. Um, so I'm going to briefly explain what MLflow currently does, and then I'll show how the new component, the model registry, uh, fits in. Um, so to explain, I'm just going to look at all uh, at these three components in turn and see how they simplify ML development. Um, the first one is experiment tracking. So the idea here is as you're developing your machine learning code, you want to be able to track you know, what version of your code went in, what data, what parameters, and how it performed, what metrics it produced, and so on. So this is just a simple simple set of REST APIs. You can use them anywhere you run your training code, you know, on-premise, in the cloud, whatever. Um, and you can log uh, information about the, the environment to this MLflow tracking server. And then that provides a central user interface and a central API to see your experiments, compare them, and keep track of how your model is doing over time. Um, so what that looks like, once you log a bunch of results, you get this UI. You can view each one of the experiments. You can view the custom things you logged, including things like like image files. Um, you can take notes on it um, to, um, you know, to, to remember, to communicate about what was happening uh, in the experiment. And then you can take many, many uh, runs and, and compare them, uh, even programmatically, to pick sort of the, the best model or to see how it's doing over time. So very simple, but you know, much easier than people sending emails around about how they trained uh, their code. Um, the other components are also uh, simple uh, and powerful. So MLflow projects is just a way uh, in your Git repository for your code. You can specify the environment it needs to run on, and then people can run the same project in a reproducible way locally or in the cloud. So very simple way to do that. And then um, MLflow models is a way to package models where the users of the model don't need to know what machine learning library you used to write it. So basically, you can take a model written in any library, even your own custom code, uh, put this in this model package, and then there are uh, built-in commands that an application engineer can use to deploy it for REST serving, batch serving, or even for generic evaluation and debugging tools. Um, so those are, those are the three components. And we've got a lot of talks about MLflow at the summit. You saw QB uh, yesterday talking about millions of models, and um, there, there are also a bunch of talks today. Um, and we also have a lot of um, uh, activity in the, uh, in the project that's been going on, of course, as I said, with, with uh, over 100 contributors. So just in the past six months, we uh, released version 1.0 of MLflow, which stabilizes everything. And then we've been re releasing new versions roughly every two months. Um, and we have a bunch of uh, powerful new features, like automatic logging, so that we reduce the amount of code you have to write for that, uh, search API based on data frames, and uh, integrations with uh, Kubernetes, HDFS, and Selden. I'm just going to highlight one of them, because I think it's cool. Um, it's further improving the tracking component. Um, so this is some code here that uh, trains a model using Keras, you know, just your standard machine learning code. And with the uh, initial MLflow tracking, API, you would have to add a bunch of stuff around it to log all the parameters and metrics and the final model you built into MLflow and then share it with other people. So, you know, it's nice you can log all this stuff, but it's a bunch of work to do it. So what we've been doing in TensorFlow and Keras and hopefully other machine lear learning libraries soon as well um, is we've been adding this auto-logging package where you just have to call one line of code auto-log and we automatically capture a lot of the, the, the metrics, parameters that the library already knows about. So now it's super easy to add um, MLflow uh, tracking into your existing code. And this is an area where you know, we'd love to, uh, to, to, to also work with the community to integrate it into uh, other libraries. So it's just one example. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Hope, hope it saves people a bunch of time. <laughs> OK. 
So, so that's kind of what MLflow is. Hopefully, has given you an idea. So now, what's this new thing that we're launching today? Uh, model management. So at the beginning of the year, we actually ran a survey of the MLflow users and asked, you know, what uh, is the next thing you want to see in the project? And this came up clearly as number one: um, uh, simplifying model management. So what's the problem? So most machine learning libraries, you know, let you, let you save your model as a file, but there isn't any good software for sharing and collaborating on these files, especially with a team. So if you're working alone, you know, you can just save a bunch of files, maybe check them into Git or something, and you, you get something like this, you know, maybe you have to name the files somehow to keep track of each version, and hopefully it's manageable because you remember what you did and what went into each one. But if you're working in a large organization uh, with many models, this management becomes a, a major challenge. So you might ask, for example, where can I find the best version of this model? Am I, am I even running the right one? How was it trained? You know, these files don't tie to any of that tracking information I talked about, uh, about how you built it. Um, how can I add documentation for it? You know, m make sure that it's compliant or just tell people what I did. And also, how can we review models before we launch them? Um, so, inspired by, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, software development tools, collaborative software development tools such as GitHub, uh, we're launching the MLflow model registry, uh, which is a, a repository and a collaborative environment for sharing and working on models. So, what this gives you um, is this repository of named version models. You can add comments and tags on them, and people can easily pull, you know, the latest version of a model through an API. And it also has this built-in concept of life cycle stages, so each, for each model, you can have versions that are staging, production, you know, archive, development, and so on. And it's got APIs uh, to easily interface with the registry, automatically test the models, you know, do CI, CD, and so on. So how does this change the workflow? So now, as a developer, you uh, log your model into the registry. It works with any type of model, as long as you can uh, package it in there. Um, and other people can go to this and either manually review it or plug in automated tools that use the API. And then downstream users can uh, safely you know, pull the latest model after it's been reviewed and checked to work. Um, uh, and you can also uh, use the API in automated jobs or in REST serving to make sure your jobs are actually using you know, the, the most stable model or the, the testing model or whichever one they want. Um, so very simple, but, um, uh, but um, uh, very powerful for uh, making this, uh, this work. Um, we've been developing the model registry um, in uh, working closely with Databricks customers for a while, actually, and uh, today we're uh, posting the first uh, version um, on GitHub with, uh, you know, with this core functionality. So we have a pull request open, and it's going to go out in the next um, uh, open source um, uh, release of MLflow. But you can check it out um, on GitHub if, you, uh, you know, if you're adventurous and just want to try it. Um, and also for Databricks customers, it is available there. You know, if you talk to us, we'll uh, enable it for you. And, and work with you uh, to test it out. Um, so that's, that's the model registry. That's kind of enough talking from me. I think for you to see um, you know, what this can actually do, uh, we'd like uh, you to see a demo. And for that, I'm going to invite Corey Zumar, one of the software engineers on MLflow at Databricks, to give you guys a demo. Good morning. It's great to be here in Amsterdam. This city has a long history of innovation, and one of the best examples is its windmills. For centuries, Amsterdam's windmills have been used to churn grain and pump water. And now the rest of the globe is catching on, embracing wind farms as a source of clean energy. Unfortunately, wind energy is variable. It depends on weather factors like wind speed and wind direction. However, our demand for electricity is incessant. So when winds are low, energy needs to come from other sources, such as burning coal. This is challenging for energy providers. In order to meet demands while remaining environmentally conscious, they must forecast wind power output hours, days, and even weeks into the future. Fortunately, you can use machine learning to model the power output of a wind farm based on weather forecasts. And in the interest of environmental protection and data science, my colleagues and I decided to try this out. We built a machine learning application that periodically forecasts the power output of the largest wind farm in the Netherlands and uses this data to reduce coal consumption. Now we're going to see how this is going.
This dashboard displays the past power output of the wind farm in addition to projections for the future. We see that output has ranged from about 1,000 megawatts to 2,500 over the last several days. But our projections look a little bit strange. Apparently, this massive wind farm will produce no energy for the next week. Scrolling down, we also see that coal consumption is projected to skyrocket in order to compensate. This feels a little strange to me, so I think we should investigate. Moving over to our Databricks jobs UI, we see we have our production forecasting job. And based on the statuses on the right, it appears that several recent iterations have failed. Let's look at the most recent one to see what happens. First, this job fetches a weather forecast for the wind farm, consisting of three features. We have temperature, wind direction, and wind speed, forecasted at several points in time. Next, this notebook fetches a machine learning model from an Amazon S3 bucket. In this case, the model is called Model 1 Final, and the bucket is called Kate's ML Models. Next, the model is loaded in Keras. And finally, our job runs into problems. This model can't evaluate the temperature features. So let's take stock of what's going on. First, we have a production application that's supposed to be helping us save the planet. But it's not working because somebody named Kate dropped in a bad model. Second, because this model is stored in an Amazon S3 bucket, I have no idea how it was built or trained, which is going to make it pretty hard to debug. Finally, there are several people named Kate within my organization. And the only one that I know is on vacation. To make matters worse, I don't know if, if Kate collaborated with anybody in order to build this model, so I'm not sure who else to ask. Now let's see how we can use the MLflow model registry to overcome some of these challenges to fix our forecasting pipeline and ultimately save the planet. First, we need to find Kate's machine learning code. Maybe she uses similar naming conventions for her S3 buckets and her Databricks notebooks. I'm going to pull up the workspace search and try looking for Kate's ML models. As I type, I see a bunch of folders corresponding to people named Kate, but none of them match exactly. And because AI is so popular, a lot of them have to do with machine learning. Kate's models sounds reasonably close. Let's see what that contains. And it looks like we have more folders and notebooks. There's a top secret project. We have a language model. And awesome, there's a directory called model one. Opening this up, unfortunately, it looks like there are multiple versions. We have versions one and three. Two is totally missing. Final, and of course, final new. We've all been here before. <laughs> final new sounds pretty recent, so let's open that up. The first cell of this notebook fetches training data for the wind farm. Let's add a new cell and see what it looks like. It appears this data consists of two features, wind direction and wind speed sampled across time. But temperature is totally missing. This may explain our production failures. Let's add temperature to the list of features and see if we can fetch the data again. Great. This looks a lot better, and it matches our production schema. So now what we're going to do is retrain Kate's model on the new data. It appears she used a neural network with a single hidden layer. And based on this comment in the last cell, Kate tried several hidden layer sizes before settling on 50. Now, unfortunately, because Kate didn't use MLflow to track her training, I don't know how each layer size specifically impacted performance. And because our training data has changed, I'm not sure that 50 is still the best choice. So what we're going to do is try several different hidden layer sizes. And we're, this time, we're going to drop in the MLflow tracking library to easily record all of this information. We'll use the very simple MLflow Keras auto log routine to simply capture it and then we'll rerun our training. As this runs, we can open the MLflow run sidebar where we see a new MLflow run for each iteration, containing important parameter information, such as the number of hidden units, as well as metrics, such as validation loss. Once this completes, we can refresh the sidebar and see all of our new runs, and then select a metric, such as validation loss, which will allow us to seamlessly find the best model. Sorting on validation loss, we in fact see that a hidden layer size of 200 is optimal for this particular data. 
and we can open this in the MLflow UI. We again see a lot of useful information, parameters, and metrics. And scrolling down, we also see all of the model's artifacts and files. Selecting this directory allows us to register the model with the MLflow model registry. We now have a couple of options. We can either create a brand new registered model, or we can add a new version to an existing model. Let's create a brand new model, and we're going to call it Netherlands Power Forecast Model. When we hit register, we're given a link to the model registry UI. And following it displays a bunch of really important information. We have the model's version, version 1, its date of creation, its author, as well as all of the activities and pending transition requests going on around the model. We'll come back to these in a moment. Additionally, this UI links directly to the MLflow source run, which takes us back to the MLflow run view. We can then click through and view an exact snapshot of the notebook that was used to produce the model, providing a complete lineage for our colleagues to later view. And this is much easier and much more reliable than searching the workspace for Kate's various notebooks and folders. Navigating back to the UI, we see that we don't currently have a description for our model. I'm going to go ahead and add one. I will use some markdown and add an overview of the model's input features and use case, as well as an architecture description, and then hit Save. Now that we have a fully tracked and registered model, let's use it to fix our production pipeline. First, I'll move the model into production. Selecting the Stage button, we see several model stages, each with a unique meaning and set of controllable permissions. For example, staging is used for model testing, while production is used for models that have passed review and are ready to be deployed. Within your organization, you may want to allow many users to move models into staging while reserving production access rights for a select few experts. If you are authorized to transition a model into a particular stage, you can do so directly. If you are not, you can request a transition from another member of your organization. Since I have authorization, I'm going to move our model straight into production. What could possibly go wrong? Great. Our model is in production. And if we scroll down, we see we have a new activity indicating that the transition occurred. This is useful for future reference and audit logging. Now we're going to integrate our model into our production job. I'll navigate back to the job and click through to its notebook. This will allow us to modify its behavior. I can get rid of all of this complicated S3 download code. And instead, I am going to import the MLflow PyFunk module. This defines a very useful function called MLflow.pyfunk load model. We can then give it a simple reference to our registered model, specifying the production stage. And that's it. With two lines of code, our production job is now linked to our registered model. We can return to the. We can return to the job UI, click through, and start a new run. And as this executes, we can actively monitor its progress. At this point, it's worth noting that because we have a stable connection between the production job and the model, any future development can occur by updating the production version in the model registry. We don't have to change any application code and risk introducing errors. It looks like our job completed, and scrolling down, we have some predictions this time. Comparing the model output to past data, it looks like we roughly follow the trends, but it's not perfect. So as our work continues, we can navigate back to the model registry at any time using the convenient sidebar icon in the workspace. This displays all of the models throughout your organization, including their versions and their stages. And if we take a look at the power forecasting model, it appears that a second version has been registered. I think somebody is trying to help us out. Opening up this version, we see that Sue Ann, one of our resident machine learning experts, has developed a PyTorch model that she claims is far better for solving this problem. And to prove it, she left us a comparison link to the MLflow UI. Selecting this link, I can view the performance relative to the number of training steps and see that, indeed, 
Sue Ann's model achieves much lower validation loss for this particular problem. Navigating back to the UI, because Sue Ann is far better at machine learning than I am, I will approve her transition request into production. And I'll leave a small comment. Looks good to me. When I hit approve, we see a new activity indicating that this transition occurred. And now all we have to do is run the job again. We'll go back to the job, and we'll hit run. And the MLflow model registry will automatically pick up the latest production version of the model. And even though Sue Ann's model is trained in PyTorch, and our first one is trained in Keras, the exact same code can be used to evaluate it, ensuring that, again, no application code needs to be modified in order to achieve successful updates. Looking at this comment, we see, or this cell output, we see that Sue Ann's model was loaded this time. And if we scroll down, we see that her model does a much better job of matching past trends, which means that we can be much more confident in the model's projections. Thanks so much for helping out, Sue Ann. Now we're going to navigate back to our dashboard, and we're going to go ahead and refresh. Now we should see updated power forecasts for our wind farm. Indeed, we're actually going to be getting some power after all. And equally importantly, coal consumption is actually expected to fall, saving us thousands of tons of burned coal over the next several days. So now, let's recap. We've seen that the MLflow model registry helps you solve three critical problems in production machine learning applications. First, it prevents you from deploying bad models by introducing tools for model administration and review. Second, it integrates with MLflow tracking to provide a complete picture of every model within your organization, including source code, parameters, and metrics. And finally, the model registry provides centralized activity logs recording the entire collaborative process from model development through deployment, complete with rich model descriptions and comments, ensuring that absolutely every detail is captured. Ultimately, the MLflow model registry has helped to fix our forecasting pipeline and protect the environment. And I can't wait to see how it will help you and your organization. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, Corey. That was awesome. That was uh, really exciting to see. So uh, that's the MLflow model registry. I hope everyone enjoys using it. Um, and if you want to get started using MLflow, it's very simple. You can pip install MLflow. Uh, you can find the documentation online. And also, if you just want to try a version that's hosted, uh, we uh, just added MLflow today to the Databricks Community Edition, which is a uh, free, small-scale version of Databricks. So you can also quickly log in uh, and try that out. Thanks, and I hope you enjoy using MLflow.